3 o'clock in the afternoon and the English Channel is flat calm, 10 miles south of the Dorset coast. But for HMS Newcastle, a Type 42 destroyer and a sister ship of the Sheffield and the Coventry lost off the Falklands, this is to be the last peaceful day for a long time to come. When, when, you, when we're in training, people have stories about Portland and sort of scares them a little bit. Most people don't like coming here because nobody likes to be told that they're doing something wrong. Some people dread it, some people just see it as a pain in the backside. What's bothering them is that they're bound for the naval base at Portland and the toughest ordeal they're ever likely to meet, short of a real battle. An ordeal that's known and feared throughout the Navy as the Thursday War. This small group of people on a Portland Harbour tug is the cause of all the worry. They're the team who work for the Flag Officer Sea Training, FOST for short, and it's their job to put each new, or like Newcastle, newly recommissioned warship through its paces. In what is just about the toughest test of professional skill you'll find anywhere in the world, before it can be passed as fit to join the operational fleet. This means keeping both ship and crew under a remorseless pressure for week after week. Because when they leave this place, they've got to be ready for anything. Say good morning. Good morning, boys. Good morning. Newcastle and her crew will have to beat off attacks by enemy aircraft, submarines and missiles. They'll have to fire their own weapons against a whole series of different targets. They'll have to put down riots. They'll have to cope with civil disasters like landslides or earthquakes. And every Thursday during the course, they'll have to fight a full-scale war, right down to keeping the ship afloat when she's been hit by missiles or set on fire by incendiaries. All the time, everything the men do will be carefully checked to make sure it's being done properly, down to the smallest detail. <laughs> Some people say it's a waste of time. I myself think it's one of the best lessons you could ever come across for sea training. Definitely. It's an elaborate and complex series of exercises. Everyone difficult and sometimes with a touch of black comedy, except that people's careers depend on the outcome. Ten minutes, sir. This is this is my job, my profession, and I'm being critically analysed to make sure I'm up to the right standard. Most people know that uh, somebody has to set the standard. As, as I said, it's the attitude. If you're prepared to be told you're doing something wrong and correct it, it's no problem. In fact, most of the problems that do occur aren't part of the ship's normal routine at all. They're hidden in the more unusual emergencies. Uh, there are parts of Portland that you'd never come in contact with again once you leave it. But obviously, there are the bits that you will come across in the, in the career. I hope Portland can actually make me a better HC, more experience, and uh, react a lot quicker to uh, aircraft emergencies. Part of the concept is to put them under a certain amount of pressure so that we see how they respond to uh, fatigue and tiredness.
to see how they respond to certain degrees of tenseness and stretch. I write reports on those that do particularly well or particularly badly, and uh, then uh, obviously, depending on how well or badly they do, it's obviously going to affect their future careers in some way or other, I would suspect. All the time, the team of experts from the FOST organization are there watching. And if the ship's company seem to be coping too successfully, then FOST aren't above adding to the pressure by throwing a spanner in the works and lighting the odd fire. Because a real war would be full of the unexpected, a challenge which Newcastle's captain Rob Davis is very aware of. Uh, if FOST think that you're doing too well, you're doing absolutely top lines, and they will pull people out to make sure that you start to trip up and, uh, and then accommodate that problem. We sometimes think that the, the Met Office puts a large black cloud, cloud over Portland. It's viewed with trepidation by a lot of people, and rightly so. It is a great deal of hard work. Most of my team on board here will work on average about an 18 or 19 hour day, uh, from Monday through till Saturday, for the whole six weeks. So they get very tired. They are, they are looked at very closely, and this place has absolute standards. There are no excuses. The fact that the kit doesn't work, there's no excuse. You have to get it working, and you have to get all your procedures right. So people are, are rather scared of coming here, because they know that they are going to be exposed, that they're going to be criticized. But it's the only way to actually achieve the right standard. And the standards at Portland are indeed absolute, not just for British ships, but for NATO warships from Holland, Belgium, and West Germany, too. And everything that Newcastle does, or for that matter, every member of her crew, will be given one of seven grades, ranging from unacceptable to very good. Anything below a satisfactory is a black mark for the man or for the ship. And if she finishes the course with a final grading below satisfactory, then everyone aboard knows only too well that she and they will have to go through the whole course all over again. None of the Portland exercises is easy, but at the beginning at least, some of them may seem to be fairly routine. One and a half cables. A replenishment at sea exercise, a RAS, is something warships have to practice all the time, so they can take on stores, fuel and ammunition. But it can still be fairly tricky to get right. Positioning a ship like Newcastle alongside the tanker at the right distance away for all the lines to be set up to harness the two ships together calls for careful and experienced judgment. So the safest way to approach is to overtake the tanker slowly from astern. One by one, the lines are set up linking Newcastle to the tanker in a complex but fragile harness. From now on, they'll have to act in close cooperation, with messages being passed to and fro between them with signal bats. And that comes down to one man in particular. I get basically give the signals with bats. Because it's up to you to give the signals. There's nobody there to tell you what signals to give. You just have to listen out and then tell them like you heave in a rope let out a rope, stop heaving, start pumping fuel, stop it. That's all down to you, basically. The whole thing just goes apart. You can lose millions of pounds worth of gear. The two ships split. Uh, you don't give the correct signal to let everything go. You know, the ship's still there. You've lost it all. Here's 2-0. Here's 2-0. Go outside. Set, Rob Davis has decided this is something he can't leave to his officer of the watch, and he's taken over control. This is something he'll be criticized for later, but he's got another reason for wanting to be in charge. He knows from his own experience as a junior officer on other ships going through Portland that there's likely to be a very unwelcome surprise hidden in this apparently simple task. And he's right. 
In a few moments, Post will tell the operations room there's a hostile submarine contact in an attack position at a time when the two ships are firmly harnessed together. And Post will be recording every second that Newcastle takes to break away from the tanker and move to meet this new threat. Is started but not selected. I should link, I should link. Rob Davis doesn't know yet what the threat is, but his first move is to call for extra engine power, ready for any emergency that Post may throw at him. And as it turns out, he's just about in time. All set to go. As soon as the ops room tells him about the submarine, the officer of the watch has to move quickly. First, he must warn the tanker to break away with a series of blasts on the ship's siren. And six short blasts! Yeah, step is to start up Newcastle's Lynx helicopter, the only anti-submarine weapon she carries. Holding. The submarine wasn't really there at all. It was just a fost invention to test the crew's reactions by measuring the dead time, the interval between receiving the warning and breaking away from the tanker. But Newcastle's performance was good enough to earn them a pat on the back at the debriefing later. What's contact 10? Thank you, sir. The emergency breakaway was well controlled and uh, carried out in a uh, good seamanship-like seamanship -like manner. Uh, the overall dead time was of 10 minutes, which is well inside fleet standards. The team is now knitting together well and uh, overall good. up to Newcastle. They anticipated the extra threat and dealt with it quickly. But later that same day, with the ship taking on fuel from another tanker, there's another dirty trick from Fost. A dummy over the side to represent a man overboard. And this time the crew have to spot the problem for themselves. Man overboard! Man overboard! Mark the clock. Once again, they cope quickly and efficiently, and eventually they score another pat on the back. They did well. The bridge reactions were good initially. Uh, the seamanship teams did well to get rid of the rig in the time scale. Uh, the ship handling was good. Uh, the man was difficult to see, and in fact, the flare we use, the smoke flare we use for exercise purposes, burns out in a much shorter time than the real one. And this highlighted the problem of trying to find the man once the flare had burned out. And that underlines the difficulty of finding somebody in the sea. It's a big place and a small person. But another day brings yet another tanker, and Newcastle's toughest exercise, or serial as the Navy calls it, so far. It's a very different kind of problem from the fairly routine tests she's met up to now. Weymouth Bay is standing in for the Straits of Hormuz, and the tanker is a British ship under terrorist attack from high-speed motorboats. 
All she can do is send out a distress call. I know you all be delighted to know that uh, in my paw I have here that the motor vessel Regal Bastille has been hit by rocket propelled grenades from orange bog hammers and in two hours, no, less than two hours, we've got to go to her assistance, which is a disaster exercise at sea. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the tone's light-hearted enough, but Newcastle's crew are in for a shock. They're full of confidence on their showing so far. What they don't yet realise is that this exercise is going to be a much tougher and more disappointing proposition altogether. The first problem is getting enough people onto the tanker to deal with all the different problems they might meet. Fighting fires, repairing damage, treating casualties, and getting the ship moving to a safe port. But Fost have loaded the dice against them. Because the tanker's flight deck is supposed to be damaged, the helicopter can't land. So every man has to be winched down onto the deck, and only two people can be ferried on each trip. In the meantime, there's very little Newcastle can do, and she has problems of her own. Rob Davis tries to manoeuvre as close as he can to the tanker to turn his ship's hoses onto the fires left by the enemy attack. But he can't risk getting too close without a black mark but ignoring the danger that, in a real emergency, the tanker might explode, and the blast and the fire might take Newcastle with it. First aboard the tanker are the men who lead Newcastle's team. Mike Beckett is the MEO, the Marine Engineering Officer, with years of experience behind him. He's been through Portland before, but that experience doesn't work to his advantage today. With him is Nick Hawkyard, the XO, or First Lieutenant. You OK, yes? Yes, that's Yeah, right. Told you I'm up there, right? Which way to the bridge? They're supposed to assess the damage, and they have to work out the right order of priorities. Then they have to wait for the rest of their team to arrive. And in the meantime, Fost will make sure they're kept under maximum pressure by the people they're trying to help, the crew of the stricken tanker. Well, I'm pleased to see you. We've taken your time, haven't you? Christ. Where are you? The only other route between Newcastle and the tanker is by sea, but the men and the stores which are needed so urgently have a long, slow climb to reach the boat, and an even longer one to reach the tanker. Mike Beckett decides it's better to do something than simply wait. He goes to repair the diesel generator, to raise the water pressure for fighting the fires. On his way back, he stops to treat a casualty. Two things Fost will criticize him for later. I think overconfidence by the MEO because he'd been before actually hindered their actual just doing the right things. The MEO goes over to assess the likelihood of the ship exploding. Yeah. He should look at the cargo. Yes. He should ask for the books. Now, he didn't do that. He went straight away to start a generator. That's what I want to make. Right. Straight into the nuts and bolts, sir. And I okay. think this is where his excellent pre-serial pre work he, he let knew, him out. He knew he was going to have to start a generator. Yes. So he, he decided he'd do that. Get, MEO get did not... Brownie points very quickly. I don't think he assessed the whole <coughs> ship situation in the first instance. That's the word. He tunneled in straight away to individual aspects which could have easily have lost the day. Frost effectively said I should have stood up on the bridge and done nothing and waited for everyone to arrive and taken charge. 
in hindsight, perhaps once I got the generator going and restored fire lane, I should have gone back to the bridge and uh, taken charge. But when you're in an incident like that and you're rushing around, the adrenaline's going, it's very difficult to shut off, if you like, and withdraw and do nothing. So if you found yourself in that situation in reality, would you still feel you were right and do what you had done? Absolutely. I'd do exactly the same thing again. I would try and restore services so that we could help the distressed and injured on, on board that ship. Petty Officer Fenn has even more problems. He's meant to be in charge of firefighting, but his team are still on their way from Newcastle. In the meantime, he's trying to cope with treating two casualties and moving them from the site of the fire. One of the FOSS team is trying to make a point by adding to his difficulties, and he seems to be enjoying it. So why are you all looking after this one? Not looking after the other one? No, With so few people on board a large and unfamiliar ship, it's hard to find out what's wrong. In some cases, members of the FOSS team have to provide the vital information needed to keep the whole exercise going. It's there, isn't it? Back on board Newcastle, the helicopter controller leading seaman Oldham is passing messages to the links as she shuttles backwards and forwards with men and stores. With only two people on each trip, it's a slow and time-consuming business. Country for five, you win now uh, 260 at 15 Everyone else has to arrive by boat and face the long and difficult climb up to the tanker's deck to join the teams who've arrived by helicopter. Come on, isn't that too much good? Keep climbing, come on. Petty Officer Fenn has got his firefighters together, but there's still a lot more work to be done before the tanker and her crew are safe. Come on, move it. As always, the FOSS team are close at hand, watching for any omission. Have they been taking notice of the signs on the doors? No. Flammable liquid? No. Yeah. They've been mainly cooling on the top and this portion of the bulkhead here, but they haven't actually checked any of these compartments, only felt the inside of the bulkhead. So they haven't bothered to go and see if there's any casualties in there? Still two casualties in the hawse are still fine. Okay. Yeah. They haven't searched the ship yet. All right, sir. see you later. Okay. All right. Uh, this is XO. We uh, saw the counter to all casualties. Two more have been found to be missing. We believe them to be in the forecastle. The team are just getting briefed and dressed now. They'll be making a re entry into the forecastle shortly. Uh, see if you can get the access to where these casualties are. You are. But it all takes a long, long time. Too long, in fact. Newcastle's team is beginning to make real progress at last. 
The fires are being damped down and the casualties are ferried back to the ship's own first aid centre. But the exercise is running out of time. Very soon they'll hear what Foss thought of their efforts today. Did they do the right thing? Did they do it quickly enough? And did they do it safely enough? No safety brief had been given prior to the ship's company, prior to them arriving on the tanker. Therefore, what had happened if there had been a major fire in the tanker? What would happen if you have to get off in a hurry? Those sort of things should be considered prior to going across. A simple system, take a klaxon with you. If you hear the klaxon, come to a muster point, wherever it may, might be. You may get caught and you don't want to get caught. MEO, sir, excellent. Good knowledge of systems, started the diesel well, but by starting the diesel, he failed to assess the total implications of the damage to the ship, and hence provide the command with the implications, salvage, was the ship going to sink, was she going to explode, was it a dangerous cargo? And I feel that that should be his first priority, get his team over, and they can do the actual technical aspects of starting diesels once he's discovered where they were. Firefighting today on board, no consideration was given to searching compartments on the boundary. There was a corrosive liquid store there and a paint shop. They should have been opened and searched, cooled, or uh, actions taken accordingly. All in all, it sounds a pretty disappointing verdict, though Newcastle's captain Rob Davis has one or two positive points to make. I think to, um, to actually successfully undertake a search, rescue, firefighting, casualties of a 600-foot ship, unknown, 20,000 tons, with 48 people, uh, is, um, is quite a task. Um, it is, if we were actually doing it, uh, we, would, we would actually enter the ship about 100 people, and it would probably take, I think, well in excess of half a day to do properly, rousing. Um, and we would actually break the, the rules of the helicopter flying and get as many people into it as possible. Exactly the same as all the rules broken of the helicopter flying when they were picking up the casualties from the LSL, you know, which was burning during the Falklands campaign. That's a classic example. So uh, I think the important things that, that come out are the command control and actually running it. It's so difficult, isn't it, for when you're the first man on the scene to stand back and do nothing, waiting for your troops to arrive because you're a chief and not an Indian. I think one of the comments from everybody who went across was that the, the goalposts moved at every stage. I think the fe my feeling was that it wasn't particularly well planned on behalf of staff and the serial was too short. And although it was a good serial, I believe that I gained about 40% of the most benefit out of it compared to most other serials where I think I gained 90 to 100%. So I was very sad at the end, actually, was a busy three-week sea period. We had this whole ship exercise where we were all very frustrated and weren't sure what we were actually trying to achieve and realised we, we had lost a lot. She just hasn't really taken training as seriously as she should have done. Uh, it's all been a little bit of a joke, isn't it? Um, they're not quite aware that it's a life or death matter. Um, and the message that everything that they do at Portland must be life or death because that's what it was like in the Falklands, that's what it's going to be like in the next war if we have one. They haven't been requested <coughs> that either. In the end, Newcastle finished the exercise with a satisfactory grade, a bare pass mark, which the crew will have to improve on next time. Now she's bound for harbour, where Bost will have a whole list of threats ready, designed to keep both ship and crew at full stretch until it's time to go to sea and to war all over again. Midway through the Portland course, and for the time being, HMS Newcastle lies safe in harbour. But that safety is an illusion. Her crew know only too well there are no days off in the middle of the Thursday war. Newcastle is part way through the Navy's toughest test of operational efficiency, known throughout the service as the Thursday war. And even though she's tied up to the jetty at Portland Naval Base, the situation is growing tenser by the minute. Bikini Red is a high state of alertness, all part of Exercise Awkward, where Newcastle is supposed to be on a courtesy visit to a friendly country in the throes of a deep political crisis. Different groups want to make capital out of this visit by a British warship. So the team from Fost, 
flag officer, C. Training, is starting off the action with a group who are staging a student demonstration. But this is just the first move. The ship has to be ready for anything that may follow it. I must ask you to disperse peacefully. Already things are hotting up nicely, though as yet there's no real threat to the ship. Portland riots used to be more spectacular than this fairly light-hearted confrontation. The acting was more realistic, and the demonstrators took it much more seriously. But the list of injuries from sticks and stones and fists mean that they're now played in a much lower key, though things can still move surprisingly quickly. <laughs> OK, sir, get your grenade men up here now. The crowd have had a thorough soaking, but still they seem ready for more. So the next step under the Navy's rules of engagement is to bring in tear gas grenades. it's an exercise the tear gas remains imaginary but it seems to have done the trick so one up to the ship's internal security platoon the only casualty is one of their own men and he's part of the exercise too but while they're treating him foster already making their next move Go. First wave comes in an attack by a fast gunboat like those used all too effectively by Iran's revolutionary guards, but it's followed by a series of other attacks. A team of snipers backed up by mortars firing from the shore, and the threat feels surprisingly real for the moment at least. Even though the realism is made as good as it can be, there's still a huge element of fiction in it. Uh, and I'm happy that the, the boys have actually performed well in reality, but albeit in that exercise, there's a huge dose of, well, there's no one there, is there? Now there are casualties who have to be treated in whatever shelter they can find. The injuries look surprisingly realistic for a mixture of makeup and tomato ketchup. Fost's point of view, now's the time to try to put Newcastle in check. Two frogmen have been planting mines on the ship's hull. Now they've been captured and brought on board. But one of them has a grudge against the other, and it's a surprise for Newcastle's crew. I want to get to a phone lot. This bastard doesn't like. I'm killing him. What happened? He's coming. Hold on. I'm him. We have the situation under control. Right, Jerry! Spit, come here. Right, now keep them pinned down. Right. Is there 
diving team to go down and find those hidden mines. This is always hard because diving is inherently dangerous. So for those who have to do the job, there's no problem at all in seeing it as a real threat. Remember safety. Remember your signals. The difficulty is that the enemy frogmen will have used every trick they can to hide the mines they've placed under the ship, so the divers can't afford to miss even one. Help! Two leave surface, three to the side of the ship, four in the water. Now get the ball in motion, get my family sorted, all right? Will. Otherwise this thing can rot. Absolutely. Okay, now move it. Now you've got to... No, that's it, zilch. You oh, said you said, you said, hang on, you said you have one more. You said you placed yeah, one more midships. Where about No, that's it's in the middle, like, right, as you look at the ship. Yep. Now at least they know what the fighting was about. One of the frogmen had been forced to take part by his family being held hostage. Once he knows they're going to be rescued, he's likely to be much more cooperative. So the officer doing the questioning has changed into civilian clothes to try to keep the atmosphere relaxed. Yeah, the phone's offline because as soon as they took over, we tried to get the phone. They've got the phone, yeah. Right. Now that's it, it's The first item was about midships. Yeah. The mark, the mark here, then we continue the search. Yeah. See if there are more uh, objects on the other ship. Yeah. Towards the uh, rear of the ship, by the air bracket, there was a second um, uh, particle we found. Yeah. Uh, connected to the air bracket, and that looked suspicious also. Yeah. And that was also marked. It was also a third item further around the bracket, which we didn't get time to mark. We were called to the surface. Now, we do have a demolition team. They have some special equipment. Which they, they give to us, we place on the, uh, the hull of the ship at a certain position so that it uh, sort of blows them, the mine off the ship, hopefully. Actually, fires a jet of water through the metal casing of the mine mm. and uh, hopefully it uh, wipes out everything that's inside it. Firing now! Right. Now things are quiet, there's time to sum up. Overall, sir, you've got a good, a good organisation for the platoon and you've got some good expertise within that platoon. Some of the, uh, the better aspects that I saw this evening was particularly the section leaders and the platoon commander during the demonstration. I think the demonstration was handled rather well and we went up through the regular rules of engagement for it. The flow of information from the ship to the platoon I thought was poor, if, if not bad, in certain cases. Uh, we did go through a lull, particularly when the sniper opened fire, it took a long time for them to actually pick up the sniper and start engaging. And I think partly the reason for that was that they were not really aware of the threat out there, so they were not aware that they, they'd actually been sniped at. And I think if they'd have been briefed properly throughout the exercise, they would have been more keyed up for it. O overall, though, the, um, the platoon is assessed as satisfactory. I, I think if we get the platoon together more often, they will certainly come up to a good standard because they've certainly got the expertise and, and the leadership there. Thanks, Mark. Diving. Assessing no problems. Overall assessed is very satisfactory, sir. Good. If I can just summarise then, um, many good points tonight. Obviously, well prepared, good command, command and control. In summary, uh, a number of exercise artificialities tonight all happened in a compressed time scale. Now, in reality, this would often go on for days, even weeks. And tonight it all happened within the space of a few hours. Nonetheless, I hope you found it a useful exercise and a worthwhile day. 
Remember, it's not just a set piece for Portland. It could happen any time, any place. All things considered, an encouraging result for the ship. But already the next problem is brewing on the top of Portland Bill. In the real world, it's a sadly familiar one. This time, the scenario is a call for help from a friendly country, and disaster relief is a familiar task for many of the Navy ships. It's a, an, an unusual exercise. It's probably the most testing exercise that ships undergo here at Portland. Uh, as I said, everyone is involved, um, and, it's, and it is unusual. Most people spend all their time cooped up inside the ship, and this is the one time we let them loose on a lovely day, a lovely day for a disaster. Um, but, you know, the unexpected happens, and uh, we try and train ships uh, to deal with the unexpected. For Newcastle, the unexpected begins in a less spectacular way, with the arrival of a local headman played by a Portland dockyard worker. He's hurt, he speaks no English, and his village has been wrecked by an earthquake. Rob Davis and his team have two prime objectives. They need to find out the extent of the disaster and to work out how best they can help. But without a common language, it isn't easy. They have to fall back on a sketch map from a helicopter reconnaissance, a set of picture cards, and a lot of sign language. It's hard to take seriously, but the underlying purpose is all too important. It's gone, it's all full. Are we happy? I think we've got a reason for it. 10 15 injuries, a well with no running water, no food for two days, pregnant woman, yes. Uh, no electrical machinery, looters, stoke civil disturbance as possible, two lorries. My team are carrying obviously a lot of water, a lot of first aid equipment, immediate first aid for stemming blood flow. Uh, they're carrying food to keep the people quiet if they're hungry. But apart from that, we'll be rendering initial first aid and then moving on. The most important task is to get information back rather than to take care of people initially. As, uh, as we go through, if we find that it's vastly different to what we're expecting, we will then be radioing that back to HQ, where HQ then has the vast bulk of the manpower ready to send forward heavy rescue teams, heavy lifting teams and firefighting teams en masse to deal with any different situations we may find. one or, or two a year will find themselves in this situation um, and it's something that obviously just comes out of the blue you you receive a signal saying that, that an island or, or a part of the country has had a problem and you need to go and render assistance To get that assistance to where it's needed, the rescue teams have to haul themselves and their equipment up a steep slope and avoid a landslide. Exhausting work in high summer. The first patrol to reach the village faces a daunting prospect. There are casualties everywhere, and they're not all in the open. Some are trapped inside buildings or under rubble. The rescue teams have to find them, check their injuries, and give them first aid as quickly as possible. Many survivors are still in deep shock. They need urgent medical attention. But the rescuers can't afford to lose sight of their other priorities. <laughs> Think about it. Right, they're trying to show you something, right? Yeah. They're hindering you at the My same time. Look, okay, listen, it's no good letting an injured person with his arm half hanging off wandering around you. This is what they're trying to show you. They'll help you as much as you help them, okay? There's a constant danger of fire and explosions from broken gas mains and leaking oil tanks. Until they can damp down the fires, all but the most vital first aid may well have to wait. At this stage, all is not quite going to plan. You sort your problem out. 
and the portable pumps are building up water pressure. So far, the firefighting teams have found progress disappointingly slow. Now they can finally get to grips with damping down the fires. But the local press, another fost man, has spotted the delay and is adding to the pressure with some awkward questions. We do the same as a normal fire brigade, all right? Life first, buildings, property, material come second. Well, I've heard a bit of somebody crying in that building. Well, you can see what it's like. All we have, until we get the well going, flushed up, pressure on. Right, quicker then. Come on. Right. People are dying in there. It is going at full speed, I can assure you. Oh. At the same time, we must maintain safety to ourselves, all right? Because if we get wiped out from being overzealous, dangerous, then you've got nobody. Always in the background, the noise of the ship's helicopter bringing up the heavy equipment needed so urgently by the teams on the ground. But there's always the danger that the downdraft will fan the flames raging all round. Yeah, it's got plastic, it's a couple of them. Okay. Primary stairs, right, we're going to get some poles. Scaffold tubes, yeah. 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 We've got them, we've got them all around. Right. That's what we're going to do, mate. We're going to get a scaffold tube. We're all going to try and lift this weight off your legs. Once we get the weight off your legs, yeah, okay. somebody will have to move on. Hang on. We'll give that a go. But while we're giving it a go, tell HQ that it looks like you're going to need an hydraulic jack. So, so, so what we're going to do is get the rescue. We're going to bring in the jack leg. Give us five minutes. Right. Let's give it a go and try and lift it. Have we got any more of these things? No, we're going to have to go around there. Go around there, Billy. Johnny, go with him. Just around the corner. OK. Is that budging? No. no. There's a longer one. Get organised. Get organised. Right. Give him a drink of water. One of the oil leaks in the main street has caught fire. For the first aid party trying to rescue one of the trapped survivors, this is yet another problem, and the fire parties have to move fast. If the fire isn't doused quickly, it can set off other hazards in turn. And even though it's an exercise, the fires are real, with the danger that they could cause genuine casualties. Full speed, lad! It's been, it's been hot and everything, putting the fires out in them buildings with major black extinguishers. And how realistic does it feel? Very realistic. So what's your next job? Is that all the fire out of there? Some fires are much more difficult to deal with than others. A blazing oil tank means the firefighters have to wear the stifling fear north suits. So young Pincher Martin will find the going getting even warmer.
rescuers have been making progress, finding more and more survivors and treating the injured. Seaman Saunders is part of a team which is finally ready to free one of the trapped villagers. Support that leg there. Stretcher there, that's the fault. Yeah, and what's that been like? Hard work, because there's two big blokes out of carry them by yourself. And is it over a sort of difficult country? Have you got to get them up and down slopes? And yeah, well, it's even the top of there. Up through all the terrain, you know, through the paths, and there was just only one person which you need four characters to shoot and carry them. Right, and how does it feel? I mean, does it feel realistic? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Oh, do you know what else you're going to have to do today? Or is it? I don't know. We'll have to do this, and then after this, we'll probably back stretch it there again and bury the dead. It's hot and tiring work, and just when the crew think the end of this exercise or serial is in sight, they're about to find the FOSS team have one more trick up their sleeves. But inevitably, some people have done this exercise before. They, they therefore know roughly what to expect. Um, so in order not to make it too predictable, uh, we throw in the odd uh, extra, extra little serial to keep, keep them on their toes. Uh, and that really is the test, is to see how, see how they deal with it. The timing was perfect. The threat caught the firefighters when they were fully stretched. One of them was writer Jones. I believe there's a gas explosion gone down there by the firefighters, and there's three firefighters down the bottom there. It's been more difficult than I expected. You've been putting a lot of hours in. Uh, the hardest thing really is keeping awake and keeping aware of yourself, keeping conscious. First priority is to get the remaining casualties cleared of the escaping gas. That means breathing apparatus, or BA as the Navy call it. But the gas could ignite at any moment, and that means a fear naught suit as well. So for an already tired Pincher Martin, it's time to swap his fire hose for one end of a stretcher. Going in there with them stretches, lifting people up and that lot, and feeling all suited a bear yeah. as well, which gets pretty heavy. It's pretty tiring, I'm pretty exhausted. Well, I'm feeling quite hot, isn't it? But I'm all right, I'll live. Does it still feel real? Yeah, dead real. Is it as you expect it to be? No, it's a lot worse. The old fort at the top of the hill makes an ideal site for a headquarters. Most of the wounded have been carried up here and a makeshift hospital has been set up in one of the chambers of the fort. Yeah, search three, search four. As soon as it's there, call me and then he'll over launch. <laughs> The ship's team has set up a field kitchen to keep everyone fed after all the hard work. But now Newcastle's crew has had another casualty, this one for real. The chief petty officer cook has had an accident, and he's been taken to hospital with burns. Petty officer Quickfall steps into the breach. We've sorted everything out now. At least we've got the casualties uh, and the civilian population fed straight away. So it was on time for that. We was a bit late um, with our own men, but then again we had breakfast before we was landed anyway. No so what are you giving them today? What's what what we've, right, we've got pork rasher, uh, a beef burger and sausage and onions. Uh, they've got beans with pot potatoes and uh, fried mushrooms. Any surprises from your point of view in the problems you met today? Anything you've learned from it? I think my biggest surprise was uh, seeing the casualties coming in, uh, injured as they did. I would have expected it uh, on that grander scale, obviously. Now we know next time if it ever happens for real, we know exactly what we've got to do. So. It's an invaluable experience. It gives us the confidence to approach a nature, an exercise of this, or a real event of this size, knowing that we can handle it. We have got the communications, we have got the organisation to cope with it, and if necessary, the ship can supply us with a backup. It's early afternoon, and after six hours of back-breaking work, the disaster is beginning to come under control at last. How's it going here? Some bits of it's been very badly held up by lack of BA in the field. It should have been down the first helicopter load and it's got held up for about an hour. It's very badly and it's, it's thrown the, sort of the whole progress of the pump out of the pitch. The techniques are alright, they kept that good, they're alright. A number of them enjoyed themselves. But as always on a Portland exercise, the burning question still on everyone's mind is 
how well did we do? As I said, it's a wide-ranging exercise, and I haven't had all the reports in, but uh, she coped with it fairly well. It was quite slow to start with, um, but once, once the show got on the road, um, things went quite smoothly, and uh, the ship's company showed a great deal of enthusiasm, and there was good, good leadership uh, from some senior rates and officers. Overall, the ship has come through with what the staff will call a sat. We've achieved the aim. We had some very good points, and we've had some which weren't so good. The strengths, the strengths are the people, uh, and, and, and this is not, it's not sounding arrogant about the Navy. I think the strengths are the, the sailors who, who serve in, and the average age of the people here is what 24 and a half. Uh, and for some of the people who you've been filming, this is the first time they've been in a scenario like this. And they gave it their best. The weaknesses are that, like any organization, is whether we have the ability to be flexible enough to deal in an ever-changing situation. Newcastle's time in port had been anything but peaceful, thanks to the assorted threats and problems devised by Fost's team of experts. The ship's company had managed to cope with everything quite well in some areas, less so in others. Overall, she's only just on the right side of the borderline, and that's a sobering thought for everyone to take with them as she puts to sea again to face the toughest and most daunting phase of all her Thursday war exercises. How well she meets these challenges will determine whether she passes the Portland course or has to endure it all over again. Castle slips quietly out to sea. The team from FOST, Flag Officer Sea Training, are planning their timetable of attacks. Orange is at war with blue. War will follow the normal format, and I'll debrief that in a minute. Going through the sequence of events, we're now departing from the harbour via Pilot's X route, uh, QZS 1. Newcastle's biggest problem is that her overall performance so far in her Thursday war exercises, the Navy's strictest test of operational efficiency, has been rated as satisfactory. In other words, a bare pass mark. So everything now depends on how well she fights these final battles. And the team from FOST will be doing all they can to throw her off balance. The scenario for today's war has Newcastle in command of a task force of five Royal Navy warships and a German destroyer. It's their job to escort a naval tanker and to protect it and themselves from a whole range of threats from mines and submarines to missiles and air attacks. <laughs> Now all that Newcastle's crew can do is wait for the first of those threats to materialize. They know that anything and everything they do will be watched very carefully indeed by the FOST experts. And each assessment will count towards that all-important final grade. All business employees sit up, aircraft now bearing. Green, two zero, crossing. Right to left. The first attack is already on its way, a communications plane with two hunters pretending to be sea-skimming missiles like the Exocets, which proved so lethal in the Falklands. Right in their sights, Newcastle and her sister ship Birmingham, when Newcastle suddenly finds herself faced with a frightening problem and an attack only seconds away. Also, all all positions below Citrep, we have a computer freeze being looked into. GDP directed, disregard. GDP indicating, blind directing. What's the point of you directing? You're nothing down here. All you can do is provide a radar commentary to him. He's, with no weapon systems down here, he's going to have a gun in emergency. 
and you've got bags, and that's it. All right. So visual indicating and directing is the best thing. All you do is provide a radar service to him. Visual guide, visual indication. Right. It suggests that we will be hit by a fighter gun attack aircraft for the next three minutes. Just for once, this isn't a problem dreamed up by the FOSS team. Newcastle's computer failure is a genuine fault, and it's one which cripples the ship's ability to defend herself and the convoy against the coming attacks. It's the worst possible failure happening at the worst possible moment. Newcastle Watch aircraft closing bearing 140. Right, right, right. Uh, in a turn, two seven zero at five miles uh, each way, joining on this circuit. Uh, seems to be too well pieced. If that wasn't enough, there's also a problem with the last resort phalanx gun. Newcastle hands over defence control to HMS Birmingham and tries to deflect the incoming missiles by firing chaff rockets. They spray clouds of metal fragments to confuse the missile radar. The attacks are deflected in what the Navy calls a soft kill. Despite the fact they lost the weapon, the computer, the ship quickly reacted and handed it over the duties to Birmingham. So the ship's reaction to their own defects was quite correct and swift, despite the fact they lost their own weapon systems. If we lose the computer, we lose nearly all our weapon systems, apart from those which, are, uh, which have their own computer system, like the Phalanx gun. Um, and for a lady of this age, uh, she runs on a single computer system. And if we lose that, we've lost a lot. Now, that isn't the same for modern ships, which are rolling off the stocks now, which have data highways, um, separate mic microprocessors. But for us, it is. Well, they've got two tracks on them. No, I don't know what they are. They're inbound. OK, get tracks on them. No allowances will be made for that computer failure. Newcastle will have to fight back by directing the guns and missiles of the rest of the force against each of the attack waves now coming in, one after the other, trying to overwhelm the defences. That blade was taken out, uh, and then uh, we got closed by uh, two uh, fighter ground attack aircraft to see how well the enemy had done. Um, what do you expect to happen next? Right, uh, what I think will happen next uh, is the aircraft will open, go uh, out, uh, form up again about 50 miles away, and they'll do it again to us. Pressure on Newcastle and her crew is increasing by the minute, and the man at the centre of the action is Lieutenant Commander Peter Havelock, who's acting as the air warfare officer. He's coping well, even with the ship's computer out of action, which makes him a prime target for Fost's unwelcome attention. This is the break, break, break. Any moment now, the Fost representative in the operations room will tap him on the shoulder and tell him he's got to pretend to suffer a major heart attack. It could almost be funny, but it's a moment when the whole exercise teeters on the brink of chaos. But they get the AWO out, and the captain takes over his job before another attack comes in. A manoeuvre which gets them a pat on the back at the debriefing once the war's over. Command veto, touch drill down there. Soft girl, sir. Um, very slow start, and the reactions to the initial so Zippo calls were, were very, very tardy. However, he did improve, and what I did like was that notwithstanding the chaos around the plot, when we took out AWO and gave him a heart attack, uh, he kept going, and uh, he kept on sowing the chaff and trying his best to defend the ship with soft kill, and that's a big tick in his box, sir. Mind you, he was helped by the stand-in AWO, sir, who I've given a very good assessment to. <laughs> 
And now another threat is developing in addition to the air attacks. One of the ships has detected an enemy submarine, which puts leading seaman Oldham on the spot. Bravo. Well, I'm monitoring the three, two dippers and one of links, which are being controlled by the SILA and the unit to us. Newcastle is an air defence destroyer, so she carries no weapons to deal with an enemy submarine except her Lynx helicopter, loaded with anti-submarine torpedoes. But can Oldham pass on the information it needs to find the submarine? It calls for a cool head, with Fost noting his every move. The uh, HC, working very hard, uh, did well, although he was a bit slow getting the Sovereignty into the system. 14 minutes, in fact, uh, even though it had been on the GOP all the time. But he is uh, working hard and, and progressing quite well. What would happen next is for us to gain contact, take one of the units' right. aircraft under control, and then get a weapon into the water. Yeah. And what's the worst thing the enemy could do to you at this stage? Hotel, Hotel or worst thing. This is X-ray 1, Victor. Hit us. Uh, That's exactly what Foster are going to do, because the only way they can see how the crew cope with a strike by a bomb or a missile is to make sure that one of those attacks does get through. This is one, one five, uh, at... Uh, 35 miles. Expect uh, missile release imminent. But they won't know the ship has been hit until the officer in charge of the FOSS team, Neil McLaren, drops two scare charges over the side. was coming but they won't know the kind of damage it'll cause as that's being carefully orchestrated by the FOSS team. So the first sign of trouble appears as water flooding into the after engine room. set that sank the Sheffield never even exploded, but it spilled fuel and started the fires which finally crippled the ship. So as the FOSS team filled the compartments and passageways with choking smoke, the first priorities are to get everyone clear, and then to organize the firefighting teams who will try to put out the fires. <laughs> Now the ship's power supplies are beginning to fail, the first of several problems the FOST planners have in mind for the harassed crew, struggling to stop the leaks in the flooded engine room. Water level rising rises initially at half a metre in the first 15 minutes, one metre in 30 minutes, at, in, the in the after engine room. At 45, it starts rising more rapidly, two metre level, so that's level with the plates between the gearboxes and at 55, 3 metres. At that point, at around the 55 to 60 minute mark, somewhere around then, the bulkhead will collapse and it will depend on how much shoring they manage to achieve on that after bulkhead. What are you doing? What about this here? Have you just got wet? Why not? You should have been. Working in the dark, the crew are trying to shore up the bulkhead with timber supports, but if they can't do it quickly enough, they know that Fost will mark the bulkhead as collapsing, and that means a big step nearer to losing the ship. The firefighting teams are assembling out on the quarter deck, where they've got a different problem to deal with. Because the power has failed, there's no pressure in the ship's fire main to pump water into the hoses. So Petty Officer Quickfall has to start the portable rover gas turbine pump to provide the pressure instead.
that is not going as smoothly as it should. One of the FOSS staff sends Petty Officer Quickfall an order to stop the rover so that all the hoses are out of action. Then another FOSS man tells him to turn it back on again, adding to all the delay and confusion. The firefighters have no option. They have to do as FOSS tells them, but they still get criticised for it. Control of fire main, then, was a bit wishy-washy. Where is the fire main coming from? Is it the rover gas turbine supplying emergency fire main, or was it from the fire pumps? Start the rover. Stop the rover. Start the rover. Well, I think we've got it. So firm control of fire main was missing at the advanced control position. Your stuff, sir. It was confusing with your stuff, saying, right, turn off the rover. We turned off the rover, and they said, well, why you stop the rover? We told you to stop the rover. What did we do, sir? You, you are identifying now the problem of there being no one in charge. There was no one actually at the scene taking positive charge. Now, we weren't doing that deliberately, yeah? But there was confusion by everyone in charge as to where the fire main was coming from. And until you can establish, if you are in charge, you must know where your fire main is coming from. Essential, yeah? You don't want to commit your troops with doubts about where it's coming from, okay? So all they were doing was making you think when we come down to Portland, we're told never to argue with the staff. This we don't do, so when we're told to do something, we'll do it. And as you saw with the rover, we was told to switch it off, so we switched it off. Then we was told to switch it back on again, so we switched it back on again. Now, it was more confusing down there than anything. That's what one of the points that annoyed me that they brought up in the debrief. Once the pump's back on and the hoses are working again, it's time to go back into the ship to put the fires out. But because it's full of smoke, they'll need Theonaut suits and breathing apparatus. Even though it's only an exercise, the darkness and the smoke make the inside of the ship seem a strange and unfamiliar place, lit only by the beams of their helmet lamps as they search for fires, for damage and for casualties. And even in the middle of all this confusion, the war is still going on. Foster keeping things on the boil with more air attacks. Down in HQ1, Mike Beckett, the Marine Engineering Officer, or MEO, and the Damage Control Officer, or DCO, Chris Baldwin, are struggling to stay in control. Their biggest problem is in dividing the work between them, as the more senior officer has much more experience. Then in five people, I'm trying to get hold of them. Right. But confusion is mounting, and the flooding in the after-engine room is rising to danger level. Only the ever-watchful FOSS umpires know what's happening, or what should be happening. HQ1, MEO, good positive charge. But please stand back. You're not the DCO. DCO became a glorified telephone answerer today, and did not assist you in establishing the damage control picture. You are confident, Mike, you know what you've got to do, but let the other people help you, okay? Really, I wasn't allowed to do my job, because the MEO is very good at doing the job on his own anyway. So I ended up being a glorified telephone handler. My brief from the captain and my responsibility during action is to keep the ship afloat, keep it moving, keep it fighting. And although, as they see in a training role, the DCO, who has not done any courses, he's a lot younger than me, and has less experience, if he's not producing the goods, I've got to jump in and take charge. And that is what I was doing. The MEO and myself have managed to define our areas of responsibility. So assuming we have another exercise of that nature, that, is, that at least is one problem that won't happen again. Yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> In the end, all the crew's efforts will be in vain. Foss decides it's time to turn the screw a little tighter. We are evacuating the after engine room. You are evacuating the after engine room, Roger. Bulkhead's gone in the after engine room. They are evacuating the fire in the after engine room. Quite valiant attempts were made by the MCR and the after engine room crew to maintain propulsion. I think they did you quite a good service there. 
They couldn't have lasted longer than the first hour because we took the engine room away from them anyway by collapsing the bulkhead. So they weren't going to win that part of it, regardless. Problem down at the quarter deck is almost underwater. Is it? Up on the bridge, the calm is deceptive. Rob Davis is trying to take Fost's advice and stand back from the action to see how his ship's company copes with events. But he still has the final responsibility for decisions, such as when to bring his damage control teams up on deck, in case Fost should decide the ship's about to sink. The casualties are the first to be brought out, whatever their injuries. <laughs> Once the engine room's been flooded, the exercise is virtually over. Why? Because by now the ship would be very close to sinking. It's been a long and tiring day, and finally it turns out to be a disappointing one too. The reports are mixed, but the overall grading is yet another satisfactory. So now Newcastle has just one last chance to pull an improvement out of the hat, out in the North Sea, where a major RAF exercise throws in the heaviest air attacks yet. Fost have ordered one little extra twist. There's now a chemical threat too. So for every task and every break, the crew must wear the cumbersome and claustrophobic protective suits. And the ship has to be sprayed with water from bow to stern and rolled from side to side to wash away the last traces of imaginary chemicals from the decks. After this, the dreaded end of course verdict comes as something of a relief. Rob Davis is guardedly hopeful. He feels that he and his team have taken to heart all that Fost have been saying and that the final assessment must surely reflect this. I hope that some of the large-scale exercises would have gone that much better. And on hindsight, or well, certainly well, so good hindsight, I think I would have uh, spent a little more time looking at the detailed organization to look at the potential weak links and then keep an eye out for those as the organization progressed. If things are going badly, yeah, it is very tempting at times to wade in with size 10 boots. And often that is not the right approach. But the best approach is to just stand back and keep people off other people's backs. Uh, that is perhaps one of my problems which I've learned about. And the other one is that um, if things are also not going well, is you get in yourself and start organizing it. Which means everyone else just stands back and says, he's doing a marvelous job, why should I do it for myself? And those two things uh, I have learned about myself. In fact, he's in for a shock. When the FOSS team meet to decide the ship's final grade, they don't sound completely happy. Right, would you like to uh, sum up overall then? On that. Yes, sir. Um, what do we feel about the overall assessment, bringing that lot together? I think, I think we, we, we've said most of it. I mean, it's a ship that could have done better um, in a lot of areas. Uh, I, and I think the reason she didn't do better is down to uh, a lack of dynamic leadership um, at the top. Um, the ship needed kick-starting uh, just a bit too often, to my liking. Uh, Monday morning, she was always slow off the mark. Um, and she needed the staff to come on board and say, hey, you know, you're not quite getting here, you're not ready here, you should be ready. And it was the same this morning. Uh, they, they're just not picking up off the mark. Um, having said that, morale of the ship's high, um, they're very cheerful. They just lack fighting aggression, I think. Numerically, sir, um, it comes out at a satisfactory. Um, and only just a satisfactory, it's not as, as low as to be just satisfactory, but she's only just scraped above the satisfactory level. Um, and that's the feel I get from the ship as well. Yes. I think you're absolutely right. I don't think the um, attention from the ship has been extracted. I think the point that I try and make when they arrive, you know, that it's their work up which we're assisting in, didn't quite get through to people. They expected the work up staff to take too many initiatives, look for opportunities for training and drive them on rather than, if you like, driving themselves on and then using us to advising them how they should go and how they should tackle it. Um, they haven't 
not set themselves sufficiently high standards, I think. And in our criteria, you know, whether or not the shop ship is uh, ready to join the operational fleet, I think one can say she is to that extent, and particularly in the area in which she's supposed to be expert. Yes. Uh, I mean, had she been weak in the anti-air warfare, uh, that would have been a very, uh, very concerned about that. Very yeah, concerned about that. As you would expect, it's warts and all here, so uh, so you'll just have to, to, to bear with the, the situation as we see you. But overall, I've assessed you as satisfactory. I think you could have done better. Um, we wanted you to do better because the people have liked coming to Newcastle. I think the morale is good. I think the ship's company are friendly. They try hard. And it's a nice ship to be with. There's a nice feeling in it. And that's uh, obviously a, a great credit to you. But I think at the same time, um, one hasn't thrown oneself into the sort of environment of, of Portland as much as you possibly could have done. Very often you're one saying, well, is this an exercise, is this a serial? Whereas I think if one gears oneself up to a more warlike footing during your time at Portland and extracts as much from it, you could have gone further and achieved more as a ship. I think if you'd have demanded your, more of yourself, I think uh, you would have uh, got more out of it. Well, that's the overall picture. Would you like to comment on any of that? I'm very disappointed, but, uh, and it lies in my hands, full stop, really. And that, that's it, really, inside. It's, uh, there is nothing there which I wish to come back at you and say, no, that, that I did disagree totally. Uh, whether I have a slight difference of flavor on it is immaterial. Uh, it is my ship. If that, that is how you see it in the, uh, in the photograph, then that disappoints me. And, and I feel that we have uh, therefore wasted part of the time here, which is, uh, which is bad. Yeah. I think if you go in for a race, you go to win. And people who go to win with it and end up on the fourth court and walk out with no one taking photographs end up disappointed. And we came here wishing to do well. And perhaps we came here with a false sense of illusion. Obviously we did. So we, we end up walking out of Wimbledon uh, with all the, all the paparazzi looking the other way. And that saddens me. And that saddens me because I know that you're going to tell the ship's company who have done extremely well. And as always, as you well know, sir, it is the sailors who, it is not the sailors who let down the ship, it is the management who let down the ship. If that is myself and my team. And it saddens me that you have to stand up there and say that to them because they have dug out and it is, it is, it is myself and the team who have let them down. Should you go and talk to them? I'm afraid you haven't uh, quite gone as far as we would have hoped. I assess you as to be ready to uh, join the operational fleet, but, but you've now got to look forward to the next to six months or a year and seize the opportunities um, to go forward and improve from here. For Rob Davis and his crew, it's a real blow. They've survived their Thursday war, but only just. They've done pretty well in their primary job, air defense, and in seamanship and navigation. But everyone feels they should have done better. One Falklands veteran said he found the stress of the Thursday war even higher than the real thing, even if it was less frightening. Another said, there are two sayings in life it's better not to believe. One of them, the checks in the post, the other, Faust, is here to help you. With the passing of time, Rob Davis at least is able to treat his ship's Thursday war a little more philosophically. It's very easy for the ship's company to get into a feeling that there's no world outside this steel box and blueberries and green overcoats form saying you should have done this better or whatever and I have to tell them there is a big world out there and that when they go we are left on our own and we're quite capable of getting on with the world without them. At the end of the day it is the commander in chief who says you take this ship and you and you operate it safely around the site the high seas.